Hi guys, uh, my name is Anton. I work uh, at Booking.com as a front-end developer. Uh, and today I would like to talk to you about identification of unused CSS code and its cleanup. Sharing with you some experience uh, from our company, how we did that. But uh, before I start off, I would like uh, shortly introduce to you who we are and uh, the way we work. So the Booking.com, one of the largest uh, travel e-commerce company. So we, uh, of, uh, so on our website, you can search and book different type of properties worldwide: hotels, uh, hostels, bed and breakfast, tree houses, and so on. And behind the scene, of course, there, there is a lot of uh, work and development on our product. And if I really roughly uh, illustrate the way we work, so it might look like this. So it's extremely simplified, just in order to highlight the key, uh, key points uh, that we would need further in the presentation. So let's go over that. So everything starts with idea or hypothesis. Uh, let's take an example. Let's say we believe that here on this page, uh, instead of the button, it will be more beneficial to have a link and we can uh, impact uh, the conversion and the click rate. Uh, then, we, then the implementation follows the idea. So where the code is written and deployed and everything uh, is ready to be lived. Once code is deployed, we uh, setting up the A-B test where, where we would like actually verify our hypothesis. And after the runtime of the A-B test, we are ready for the decision. So we have a data so we can compare and uh, to see whether actually our hypothesis is true. So whether the link is more beneficial than the button. Uh, and here, uh, just in case, let's me uh, let me define what the A-B test is because we would need that further. Uh, A-B testing is a, a statistical method of uh, verifying hypothesis via controlled experiment. When you have two or more uh, Variants. So in, in variant A, you just propose your website as is without any changes. And in group B, you propose the same plus the change you're looking at. And after the sum runtime, you gather the data, uh, the metrics that you're looking at. In our case, it will be uh, click rate. And you uh, can, with a certain confidence level, you make a, can make a decision. And in our company, it's really important to uh, spend as little time as possible between the idea and the decision point. And in this sense, uh, the priority not always uh, go to cleaning up unused code. Let's say in our example, after the EBIT test, we can say, OK, so link is not beneficial. So let's keep the button. But the code that we uh, wrote for the link, this is the markup and styles, is still there. And if you don't clean it up, so it impacts the amount of unused code. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Why CSS? So there are a lot of questions I put here. So that's kind of the, my idea is to name and acknowledge the problem itself before I move to the, to the solution that we took. So the why CSS? The CSS, one of the languages that, languages that we used uh, in our uh, daily work work of the front-end developers. It's not because we too, uh, I'm going to talk about the CSS not because it's more important or critical or anything like that. If we will compare JavaScript and CSS, so there are indeed like a lot of difference here. The JavaScript is a programming language, while the CSS is a language of the document presentation. So how does that matter here? Uh, the JavaScript being the programming language has the control statements, has the var variables, so the semantics of the code is much more easier to track. While the CSS is just a list of uh, CSS rules, so basically list of the declaration. And the only semantic you can get from the CSS is the name of the class, name of the ID. And during, uh, after the some time, let's say after the five years, it's not always uh, obvious well, we, what does this selector mean, where did it come from? So have to actually do the reverse engineering to uh, track it to the actual feature or whatever. While in JavaScript, you can, as in here in this example, you can take a look at some variable, uh, do some reverse engineering and, and understand, let's say, that this variable 
doesn't take this value anymore. So that means that this branch of code might be removed. So what, what does quality of CSS impact on? So why does this problem exist? So, and I would like to start with the user experience. And here, the critical rendering pass is a um, really important part where the CSS uh, comes to play. So the critical rendering pass, basically the time the browser spends after, uh, between the page uh, request and uh, the moment when the user see the first content. And in this pipeline, the CSS uh, play the critical role. So, because in order to render anything, the browser uh, need to have the render tree, which in turn is the combination of the CSS object model and the uh, document object model. And for the CSS object model, we need the CSS. It's obvious, right? Uh, so that means that sooner we de deliver CSS, the sooner the, sh the first frame is going to be rendered here. Uh, here I would like to share with you some example uh, from our website. This is a booking process page for a web mobile. So it doesn't really matter what's exactly on the screenshot, but you clearly see when the first uh, frame, uh, meaningful frame, is rendered here. So it's around 3.5 seconds. And if you take a look into the breakdown on that, uh, we can see that uh, render blocking style sheets impact this number by 1.5 seconds, which kind of the signal that there is a room of, of for improvement here. The next is developer experience. There is such a thing, developer experience. And uh, so it's kind of more broad term of technical depth and stuff. I just would like to highlight the few things that I, I selected, like the code analysis. Uh, in Booking.com, it's really a uh, normal situation when I uh, switch the team. So let's say today I work for the search result page. Tomorrow, after the six months, I can go to the hotel page, which means that I would need some time to analyze the uh, technical, te technical uh, stack of the new team, what kind of components they use, uh, what is the framework, because it might differ. And the more code you have, the more time you spend for that. The same for the support. So if you're not sure whether this code is used or not, you need to consider it as used, and you need to support it. And it also uh, impacts the velocity, not in a good way. And the risk to make a mistake, there is always a possibility, let's say, to deploy the unused code just by mistake, which wouldn't do any good for the website. And just in general, so I really believe that the being a the develop developer work is really interesting, but not the easiest one. So why, why make it even harder supporting unused code, right? Uh, here I would like to share with you some numbers of the CSS selectors. Uh, from now on, I'm going to share uh, uh, examples based on the two main scenarios on our website, the search result page and hotel page. And here you can see the numbers of the selectors uh, broken down by the platform. It's important to note that these numbers, even though they're huge, but at a certain moment of time, user doesn't see this amount. This kind of uh, union of sets. So that's uh, like uh, if you take out the unused uh, code, code uh, from the repository, that's number will be like this. But at a certain point of time, user doesn't see this amount of selectors. And out of these numbers, it's important to note so-called specific selectors. Uh, by specific, we mean selectors which are specific for this certain page, because we have some generic elements like uh, headers, footers, which are like cross-page uh, cross elements. But let's say for the search results, there's a hotel card, which only appears in the search result. We would need that subset further. Uh, so from the problem statement, let's move on to, to the solution, identifying the new CSS code. Before approaching the problem, of course, we uh, decided to take a look at uh, is, what is possible to reuse uh, uh, from existing tools. And here I would like uh, to talk from the DevTools, uh, Google Chrome DevTools perspective. Some other solutions, there are some other similar solutions, but I just generalized it and we're going to talk from that perspective. Uh, 
Dev, Google uh, Chrome DevTools started to offer CSS and JS JS code code coverage, where you can actually browse the page, open the open the tool, and see the rate of the unused code for your CSS and JS assets. You can even interact on the page, and this upset, uh, this numbers uh, will be changed according to the new elements appear, and you can go into each of these files to see actually which rules are used or not. So it looks pretty good, pretty good. But what the problems we experienced with that? So why we didn't uh, go this this solution? So if I define, if I could define the content of the page or on our website, it will be a function based on multiple variables. And by variables, I mean um, apart from the generic things like authentication level, language, uh, location of the user, there are also the big number of A/B tests. Uh, that run at this moment on a website. So the, a number of all possible combination of uh, the result of this function is really, really huge. And we don't really have the list of the scenarios on the web page because of that. So it's, it's impossible to keep it up to date because the new experiments start and stop and it's really, uh, really hard to keep it up to date. There is no need for that. And also, there is a manual step. That using the Google Chrome DevTools means that you need to go on your page and click all possible things in order to gather the coverage. And the most important is scalability. Let's say we went this approach and we covered uh, search result page. That's good. But it doesn't help us in any way for the, our next scenario. When we move on to the hotel page, then we would need to do everything from the very beginning. So it's not scalable. So how to cover all, uh, all the scenarios we have? We decided to go to the crowdsource approach. So basically, we identifying the used and unused code within the browser session. So there's a really, uh, uh, really uh, brief scheme how we do that. And from now on, I'm going to go over all these steps. So the basically, in a browser session, um, we uh, take the list of all selectors on the page, test these selectors, and at the end of the session, we send the da data to the server. So pretty, pretty straightforward. The first step, selector list. So here I would like to share with you uh, some things that we were struggling with, so maybe it will be useful for some of you. So. Uh, every document, external uh, style sheet, uh, is linked via link uh, tag. And uh, in a JavaScript, actually, it's accessible. So you can access to the CSS object model like this. And you uh, can get pretty nice object here. But if you uh, will try to access the rules of this style sheet, uh, you will get uh, the, this uh, error. And this error is because uh, usually we have our assets, CSS and GS assets, hosted on a different domain. And accessing to the CSS object model is under cross restriction. There is a workaround around that. It's a cross origin attribute which can solve this problem, right? So putting it here, so now we have the CSS rules. And if we expand them, we can even can, the, uh, can have an access to the se uh, selector of uh, the rule which actually what we wanted. But however, the cross-origin attribute is not widely supported, and there is also some issues with the proxy servers, which might cut off the uh, headers, which are needed for course uh, restriction here. And your users can even get no style sheet at all. In order to solve that, we went for this approach. So we just create a sort of the dummy style element in a DOM. Uh, with the med media that don't exist. And we put the content, just the text of the style sheet, in there. And the browser does the parsing for us. And after that, we have an access to the CSS rules again. After we have the list of the selectors, we need to preprocess them in some way. What do I mean here? So we have a lot of Cevda elements and Cevda classes, of course. And some of them, let's say the hover, so in order to cover this, uh, 
this, in this case, you need to have a JavaScript actually to listen to the hover, which might be really expensive. We decided to just cut off all pseudo elements and pseudo classes. So we just uh, left the basic part of that. The next step, once we have the list of the selectors, we can start testing. By testing, I mean we literally try to find the selectors in a DOM tree. And the problem that might be here, uh, and it is, uh, it's that our DOM is being mutated all the time. So we open different pop-ups and drop-downs, and the DOM is being changed. That means that at one moment your selector might be unused, but once the pop-up is shown, it's used, right? So we need to cover these cases somehow. So you have a list, and once, once you found that it's used, you just drop it off the linked list. But can we afford it? Uh, here, what I mean, so uh, everything which has happened on the page is mostly handled in the main, in, in one thread, so for, for the top of your browser. And this thread is extremely overloaded already. So it handles the user interaction JavaScript and all rendering pipeline here. And of course, we're always aiming to the high uh, frame per, uh, per second. So we would like our animation to be smooth and stuff. So, and do we really have the room here to actually do some kind of this kind of testing? However, we have. So we have, in some browsers, we have request idle callback API, which actually, so what it does, so the, when the browser finished all the job before the rendering the certain frame, and if it has some time left, it can dedicate this time to the callback you provide to this function. And within this callback, you even can ask how much time is left for this idle uh, time. But as you saw before, um, I, I mentioned the numbers of selectors we have beforehand in order for you to understand the scale of the problem we had. And I started actually to wonder, okay, so what will be the test rates of how many taste tests, selector tests per second we can have? So, and I just opened the Google Chrome and just, and just did it. So with, with quite performing machine, so I've got this, I've got this. So it's around 56 selectors per second. And if we have, let's say, uh, 7.5K selectors that we would like to test, then we would need four minutes per browser session to test that, which is really higher than the time you user usually spent on the page, right? In order to solve that, we went to the approach of just to shift the cursor of our linked list to do some render position. And we have a lot of users, and every user has his own arbitrary position. At the end of the day, we cover all set. But what about these guys? As I mentioned, request idle callback is really interesting and really useful thing, especially for these background things that the users don't really care about. Uh, but we still have uh, the browsers. At, at the beginning, we thought that maybe it's not really necessary to cover these browsers. Because let's say if you build the coverage uh, in a Google Chrome, maybe it's already enough. But unfortunately, we still have some vendor-specific selectors for Safari, for Internet Explorer, which means that they might be, the selectors might be unused from the Chrome perspective. But uh, once it's loaded in Safari, it may become used anymore, uh, used already. And that means that we can get the false positive if we will go only with Google Chrome. And we had to come up with some fallback solution which actually is kind of the same approach, but we just degradate some things that are not supported in this browser. So request idle callback, just go to the set timeout, but with some important limitation. Of course, we cannot afford testing as aggressive as we do with a request idle callback, because set timeout has no idea about the frame time, right? And so we can cause a lot of janks and hurt the user experience. We decided just to do the N iterations within the one browser session, and just putting the random offset of the browser, uh, of the session time, so the page is loaded, and the way we wait the random time and start testing. 
And at the end, when we have the data, we send it uh, the most efficient way that we could. So we try to go with the service workers in order to send it once at the end of the browser session. Or we do the multiple uh, Ajax, Ajax requests here. So, and we've got the data. But we, we, we didn't expect, actually, that it will be super perfect at the very beginning. And I would like to share with you what went wrong. We've got some CSS files, some selectors from the CSS files that we actually didn't know anything about. We didn't have them in our code base. And we were thinking, OK, so where did they come from? And we figure out that we have a lot of the three, three providers. The website, third-party website, which actually have the different layout, uh, but they are rendered by our engine. And some styles just overloaded by their style sheets here. And so at the end, it didn't hurt the data, but it just, uh, so we, we had uh, the, 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 high, the, the bigger high load at the back end. So it was the backend guy problem, and it was for him super interesting to solve. But the good news is that the data was still valid. It just was uh, bigger than we wanted. And during the testing, we had some uh, JavaScript errors that I would like to share with you. So here you see the syntax error and unrecognized expression and this string. Uh, as I mentioned before, so we cut off all pseudo elements and pseudo classes. Also, if we have the CSS rules, when we have the multiple uh, selectors divided by comma, we separate them and test as a single ones. But the way we do it, we do it in exactly this order. So we divide this, uh, the selectors into simple ones and then cut off the pseudo elements. And if you take a look at this example, so we just break this logic. So we just didn't assess how complicated some of our selectors might be, right? So if we do, if we implement this algorithm over this string, so we get exactly what's this error about. The next. So it's less verbose, so there is no any artifact in the uh, error message, unfortunately. So just invalid or unexpected token. I hate this kind of stuff. And we were really like experiencing a lot trying to figure out so what was the reason. And the reason was like this. So we have this atomic selectors that we use in some cases. And so also we like didn't assess that, uh, that case. And cutting off this pseudo element, which is actually not the pseudo element, you get this string. When you try to find it in a DOM tree, you get this error. And the last one, uh, the my favorite, is like selector not found. What do I mean here? Here you can see existing selector in our code base, right? So it's really long, maybe not so super efficient, but nevertheless. So for you, I structured it in the all seven parts, basically all seven classes. And it was in a database, it was absolutely valid. And all these names actually matter for us. So we understood, OK, so cool. That's, that's from the search result page. So it should exist, but in a code base, there, is, there was no any file where we can see that. So it was, it was mystics for us. And then, actually, we found in a repository the sort of the synonym for this selector, which absolutely identical from the semantic point of view. But from the string point of view, you can see the order of the classes within the different nested level is changed. So why it happened, the, when the browser builds the CSS object model, uh, on, a, on a purpose, it's either optimized or sorted in a way within the uh, certain nested level, which actually doesn't change any semantic. But from the string point of view, from the database rows, it's completely two different rows. You cannot aggregate them, right? So, and what I did, so I, I had to sort of normalize these selectors to uh, shuffle the selectors back to the, origi to, to the original version. And finally, when we have the data, how did it look like? This is the ratio of unused selectors uh, for, the, for the hotel page. So the red color is unused. So this all three web platforms that we support, desktop, mobile, tablet. And you can see the ratio of the unused selector is quite high, right? The same, but for the search result. So it's, it's always was kind of the good, good result, good in a case that 
so we spent time and we were rewarded with identifying a lot of unused code here. But <coughs> talking about the unused selectors, I didn't uh, define what do we call unused selector. And it was a really tricky question. What selector should we call unused? Uh, on this graph, uh, this graph uh, about the number of tests we performed against certain selector and the percentile. So how to read this graph? Uh, here's a, like a small example. Here, uh, I would say that 10% of selectors were tested not more than x times, or 90% of selectors were tested more than x times. And the graph, this is real graph of that testing session. And if you can see this uh, point on the curve, starting from the 20%, it's more or less flat. So it looks like there is no like a big reason to get the threshold even more safe because the number of tests doesn't grow that much from that. And we stand for that. But still, even standing for this person too, it's not really guaranteed that that's going to be safe for us. But we do everything we launch, and sometimes even fixing, under the A-B test that ensures that we don't hurt or we actually uh, impact the sum metrics in a good way. And we decided to put the data into actions. So there is a search result page with the old CSS. And this is, it was like, it was a really interesting moment when we actually compiled the CSS, removing all process CSS with removing all unused. And we were, okay, that's a moment. Let's open the page and see how would it look like. So whether the data we collected in our CSS coverage is that valid that the website would look the same. And it would look pretty well. That was a really, really good surprise. But however, if you take a look more in details, there is indeed some degradation. So this label on the hotel card so is gone. And we started investigating what was the reason. And the reason might be explained within this timeline. So in our company, we start and stop, as I said, a lot of the A-B test. And it's absolutely normal that some A-B test might be started and stopped multiple times because I could get some bug or I, ca I would need to refine the experiment. I just stop it, I, uh, I, de I deploy the fix and start it again. And we collected the coverage data within the certain time period. And as you can see, the experiment one was stopped at this moment. But after and during the coverage, of course, the selectors, uh, which were respons responsible for the experiment one feature, they were identified as unused, which is fair enough, right? Because it was stopped. But then the owner of the experiment started it again. And he started that. Uh, and there was no CSS anymore because it was kind of blacklisted by the coverage data. And that's what exactly happened on the previous screen. So that label was degraded because some experiment was restarted after we got the data. And in order to um, get the final verdict of uh, our coverage data, we decided to set up the A-B test where we would propose the cleaned version of CSS to the group B. And actually, we had not only group B, so it was like an uh, experiment with the three variants, base, uh, variant one, and variant two. So that's like a really rough uh, explanation of uh, deployment process. I have generated CSS files here. And there's an example uh, selector. And at the end of the processing, we had three version of one style sheet. Within the first version, it was as is. And the second one, you can see, so it, it became weird, just some sequence of arbitrary letters and numbers. And at the third one, it's gone. Yeah, so we cleaned it up. The reason we had the three variants, because we were aiming to have a two statistical tests here. We wanted to measure the impact of uh, reducing the size of the CSS, and also we wanted to ensure that we don't break the layout. It's a two different tests. Beca if you put everything in one test, you wouldn't know which helped and, and which one hurt it. So you need to, to have two different ones here. 
And at the end, we've got some results. And fortunately for us, it, they were quite positive. That's the number of the selectors we had for the tablet platform for the whole tool page. This is the number of specific selectors which, were, uh, which appeared only on the whole tool page. The 5K five, five selectors, 85 kilobytes gzipped. And that was, that was after that. So we've got kind of the good boost here. And uh, DOM content loaded is now triggered uh, 120 milliseconds earlier, which is not that super good, but still that's a result, right? And the last one, but it's not least for sure, it's the uh, velocity of the team was improved. That's something that is really hard to measure, and that's why there is no numbers. So I don't know how about you guys, but we didn't come up with any uh, valid and uh, reliable metric half to measure the performance here of the development. So at the end, does the problem exist for you? It really depends. It really depends. So you might have a really small website or something like that, or you, your code base is just one year old, maybe. It's too early to think about these kind of things. Choose the solution which is suitable for you. Maybe even if you don't have uh, the small website, maybe the Google Chrome DevTools uh, CSS coverage could solve the problem for you. And if it does, there is no need to do this engineering around the, this problem. Measures the result. So uh, kind of never, it's, it, it's impossible to prove anything if you cannot measure that, right? So you need to think beforehand how would you assess the result. They have to be quantified. The last one, care about the velocity. I really believe in these kind of things. Even though your manager uh, could, couldn't, couldn't believe that or wouldn't allow you to dedicate time on that, but your colleague will be thankful for that. And thank you for listening. Okay. May I make a selfie? Yeah, audience? of course, guys. No, I put the more bright, uh, okay. That's fine. Can you turn uh, on the light, guys? Yeah. It's for better selfie. Can you turn on the light? Just a second. Yeah. Yes. Guys, raise your Make hands. There's also a selfie. You in the selfie. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And now, you are welcome. after awesome selfie, let's do an awesome interview. Now, first of all, um, have you ever faced like a really huge problem after removing unused CSS? For example, removed like one style and the whole, whole, web, uh, whole website just went down. Uh, it, it, there, it was issues, this kind of issues, but not that big. So it, it because it still it's a CSS, so you need to remove the really significant fraction of it in order to the makes site look like a uh, pumpkin. So it, it's, it's really hard to do that. But we really had some scenarios which were really hard to test for us because sometimes we really don't know which kind of um, experiments are run at this time. And sometimes you don't know how to reproduce them. And you start the cleaning experiment when some of the users are proposed with the clean CSS. And after the few days, you're reached out by the, some developer who started his exper restarted his experiment. And okay, okay guys, so I don't know what's the problem, but I start my experiment and I don't see any, any, any change, so it's broken. Uh, and that's a problem uh, so which is impossible to avoid in the big companies. So that's something that we accepted and all developers, they should be responsible. So when you start your experiment, you need to test with our feature, so with our uh, cleaning experiment. And if it's broken, they reach out to them. We update the blacklist of the selectors, removing their uh, selectors, and they are ready to go as well. Okay. And many of modern sites, um, I even think the most of them, have unused CSS code. Uh, so how can we encourage people to remove it? I mean, it works. So how can I convince uh, business that I really need this refactoring? Oh, this really broad question about the refactoring. So it's it's I think it's really hard to prove uh, unless you really blocked in development and you cannot t put the new feature on top of the existing code because it's too messy. Sometimes, sometimes it happens. But for us, 
I was asked a lot of by, by the de fellow developers in my company at Booking.com saying, okay, cool, we don't need to clean CSS anymore. We have this tool. And I said, nah, uh, uh, uh. no, 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 it's just one time thing. Because if it will be work as a service on a, let's say, monthly basis, people will stop care. They will think that, okay, there is sort of garbage collector going after them, identifying the unused code, and we'll do it automatically. No, that's why we decided to do it once, because we have some historical kind of depth. And then we start we kind of aiming to leave, start living in a new way. Okay. So uh, I have to ask this question. Uh, so what do you think about CSS and JS? And particularly they claim that uh, they have this problem solved, like because you import only those files that you use, so you always have only necessary CSS. So do you think it's a solution to this problem or it's also have its own like uh, edge cases and you don't think it's like uh, an ideal, the, like it's silver bullet or something? I think nothing is a silver bullet here. It, I, I don't know, so for me, uh, for us it was really uh, important to have something which uh, you can prove with the data, right? So, and having the huge number of experiments in turn uh, get you to a lot of number of combinations of the Kafka page might look like. Yes, and uh, the manual checks, so I, I feel that they're really impossible to do. So you, you could like finish all your list of the scenarios, but after that somebody st started 100 new experiments and you need to do it over again. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.